Amen. Well, good morning and welcome. Uh, we're going to consider this morning uh, scripture teaching from Paul's letter to the Colossians. So if you have a Bible, if you could turn to Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse 16. Going to be reading uh, from the ESV. Would you listen now with open ears as I read these words from the book that we love? This is Colossians 2, beginning in verse 16. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or new moon, or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body nourished and knit together with its, through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. If with Christ you have died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to its regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Referring to things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings, these have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Father God, we come to this time and we sit under these words, and I recognize, Lord, that as we come today, we do come from all kinds of different places. Some of us come here and our lives are filled with good things. Others of us come here and our lives are filled with worries and anxieties. Lord, some of us come here believing in you and hoping in you and looking forward to the things that you will communicate to us through this time in the scriptures. Others of us come here today and, Lord, it feels like our faith is just hanging on by a thread. Uh, to be sure, for some of us, we're here today uh, and we're not even sure if you're real. We're not even sure uh, if you are real, if you're good. Uh, and if these words that have just been read will have any impact on the things in our lives that matter the most at this time. Lord, I pray that whatever place we find ourselves in, whether we are here uh, in a spirit of celebration or worry, whether we are here bringing much faith or dealing with all kinds of doubt, I pray that you would give us grace to see that in the way that matters the most, that we do all ultimately come the same with an overwhelming and an unrelenting need to hear from you, to know you, and to be changed by you. Would you open our eyes and show us how you have addressed this need in the person and work of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome. So good to be with you again. Uh, we are in a sermon series on the book of Colossians that we are calling Christ in Us the power of an uncommon community. And in this series, what we're attempting to look at is the question, what is the essence of a community, right? What does a community look like when the very essence of that community is determined by the presence of Jesus Christ in the souls of each one, right? Christ in us, which is really the central message of the book of Colossians is that to be a Christian, if you're wondering what does it mean to be a Christian this morning, it means that God is real, and it means that when you receive his grace, when you trust in him, that his very essence, his person, comes inside of you at the deepest level. That he communicates to you not simply on the external, but on the deepest level, which the apostle refers to using the words, Christ in you, the hope of of glory. And so what does it look like, we're asking, to be a community that is defined, its very essence, is the presence and the power of Jesus Christ in the soul of each one? What does that look like? And there's one simple word that I, this passage brings out that I would like to set before you this morning. One simple word this passage brings out in answer to that question. To have the presence of Christ in you, 
right? To have a community that is defined at its very essence by the presence of Christ, right? That means that you will grow, right? That you will not remain the same, right? We'll, we'll, we'll drill into this later in the message, right? But to have the presence of Christ means that you don't stay as you are, right? Because Christ is always growing those whom he dwells in. He's always changing. Let me read to you one passage that brings this out. 2 Corinthians 3.18, right? Says this, and we all with unveiled faces beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. What is that saying? When we behold Christ, we undergo change. This word transformation, you probably know it. It's the word metamorphazo, right? By which we get metamorphosis, right? You have a fundamental and a significant and a substantial change that takes place in your life as a result of an encountering Jesus Christ repeatedly. Now, what does that mean, right? For example, you become more free. You experience a greater degree of freedom. You are less controlled by what others think about you. You're less controlled by your own desires and impulses. You become more generous. You become more forgiving. You become more humble. You become more courageous. Just a kind of a smattering of various things that we know from the scriptures, what it looks like to grow as a Christian, right? Now, what this passage is concerned about in particular is one of the most effective tools of Satan, and Satan will make a cameo in this sermon, by the way, that stops you from growing, right? One of the most effective tools that Satan has that can stop you from growing. Now, to bring this out, I want to give you a tale of two children. Anyone here have more than one child? Anyone here have more than one child? I see that hand. Okay. So I just want you to imagine a family with two children, okay? Right? Not that this ever happens in real life, but it might. Okay, a family with two children. And these two children, raised in the same home, by the same parents, wouldn't you know it, but they're very different. They have very different personalities. One child is a rule follower. Oh, she a good rule follower. You give her a rule, and she will follow it so well, so perfectly every time. She'll even get a little annoyed if, if others aren't following. She's so good, never messes up, never needs to apologize, never needs to do anything like that, is always keeping the rules very good. The other child, though, is what we might call a free spirit, right? Does anyone have a free spirit? Anyone at all? <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, this person, on the other hand, wants to follow the rules, but is just so hard. <laughs> you know, the, the desires that they have are just so difficult to overcome, and so they're always getting in trouble. They're always having to apologize. They're always on timeout. They're always in detention. They're always being criticized. All these things, right? You know, so this, some of you, this happens in a family, by the way. God seems to do this. Here's the question. Which child do you pray more urgently for? What do you think, Lily? Which child gets the more urgent prayer? Free spirit? Who thinks the free spirit? Right? Who thinks the rule follower? Oh, it's 50-50. It's even. Well, um, I, I think this passage is going to suggest to us that actually the, um, the bigger risk in life Right, the bigger risk in the kingdom of God actually goes to the first one. And we'll bring that out this morning. You pray for both, by the way, and they both have their challenges, but there is a particular challenge that the first one faces that, by the way, as a parent, and I'm just giving you some counsel here, you have one of these kids, it's great. Everyone's got their own personality, but you need to be on your knees, especially for the first one. Let me try to prove that to you from the passage I want to sketch the argument of the passage here. Um, the passage is concerned 
about uh, what, what I'm going to abbreviate using the language of legalism, right? And, and I want to tell you, when I think of the dangers to your soul, the things that will keep you from growing as a Christian, probably close to the top is the issue of legalism. I'm going to try to prove that to you here. Let me see if I can get my slides to work. Go to the next slide, please, Eva. Okay, just stay on this one. This is uh, Paul's letter to Timothy. I want you to hear this very carefully. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith. Okay, this is called apostasy, where you walk away from Christ altogether. By devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Okay, so these folks are becoming deceived, and the source of the deception is demonic power, okay? So this is really scary stuff, right? These folks are having seances, and, you know, they're getting out their Ouija boards, and they're doing all these scary things, right? Through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, okay? So the folks that are teaching them, they have no conscience. They don't tell the truth. They lie at every moment, right? Now, in your mind, what are they teaching, what, what, is, what is so outrageous of a teaching that would warrant these words, right? What is it? What kinds of heresies are they teaching? Arian heresy, right? Think about all back through church history. What is going on here? What is it that they're communicating to people that is damaging them to such an extent that would warrant such a description? Okay, next slide. Uh, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Do you see what's happening here? These folks, the liars, the deceivers, the demons, what are they teaching? Answer, legalism. They're saying, you're not allowed to marry and you're not allowed to eat this. Right? They're more strict, for example, uh, than would be appropriate. And Paul has no time for that whatsoever. It receives the strongest condemnation that he has to offer because it represents a particular spiritual danger. So let's try to sketch the argument of our passage this morning, if you have it in front of you. Uh, in verse 16, this is what he says. He says, number one, do not let anyone pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink or with regard to a festival or new moon or a Sabbath, right? So these were basically holdovers from the Jewish faith. Jewish faith had holidays. They had food laws. They had all these things, right? And as the church comes about, there's kind of some confusion on do we have to still celebrate these things? Do we not? What's going on? Uh, and what Paul will say in verse 17 is, he says, these are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Now, to understand this argument, I'm going to make it very simple for you. Right? Why is legalism so dangerous? Why is, you know, if, if you're hanging around with someone who's just extra strict, like, a, you know, not only do you have to live, you know, a pure life, but don't even get married. That's wrong. Or not only do you have to live a moral life, but just stay away from these foods because, you know, they have gluten in them or whatever. Is anyone gluten-free? I don't mean to offend you. Okay. Um, no offense. But uh, so why is this so dangerous, right? Why is he so... Uh, concerned about this. And in verse 17, what he says is, he says, look, these things referring to the Jewish ceremonies, these laws, they functioned as a shadow, right? You know, you know what a shadow is? You have light, it comes in, and you interrupt the light, and you get a shadow. And a shadow is a poor representation of something, Right? For example, you can, you, know, you can make shadow animals with your hands that can look very different than actually what's real. It's a poor representation of the thing that it's reflecting, right? And so what Paul is saying is he's saying all of these laws, all of these rules, all of these traditions, they had as their goal 
to communicate something about Jesus Christ. And now that he's come, right? Spend all of your time focused on him. Don't worry about those things. Those things were simply looking to point you to him. And now that he's come, they are serving as a distraction. And friends, this is probably, I think, the heart of the matter, right? Why is legalism so spiritually toxic to your soul? Why is it so dangerous to your life? And the answer is because in the economy of Satan... The strategy of evil is always to distract you from Jesus Christ. It's always to distract you from Jesus Christ. I was uh, talking with someone about prayer. The person was relating, you know, uh, really want to do a good job praying. You know, I don't pray very much. I want to pray more. And I said, well, why do you want to pray more? And he said, well, because I want to, uh, I want to be a good Christian, right? I want to do that. And I said, well... I think that's kind of a bad reason, right? Because what happens if you succeed, right? What happens if you buckle down and you master this issue, right? Well, if you succeed, you're going to become arrogant that you succeeded, right? And if you don't succeed, you're going to despair because you failed, right? That's how the law works. The law is always trying to take the focus off of Christ and on to something else, And I said, what if we look at prayer and we say, you know, I don't want to miss out on God's blessing. So let's go to prayer, right? I don't don't want to live without his power anymore. I'm unsatisfied with that. So I want to be with him in prayer. You see the difference in how that's working? You see the difference in how that's functioning? And what Paul is saying here is that uh, this community was struggling with a culture of judgment, right? A culture of judgment. People were walking around afraid of being judged. Oh, did you see that person? They're eating shellfish. I cannot believe that they're doing this, right? They, they don't, they're not strict in practicing these things. And Paul has absolutely no time for this whatsoever. He'll go on in the second phase of his argument in verse 18 to to use similar but even more strict language where he says, um, not simply to let anyone pass judgment on you, but verse 18, let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind. And it's interesting here because um, really the heart of legalism, by the way, the heart of legalism is actually arrogance. Do you see that? He says, these folks that are insisting on asceticism, their minds have been puffed up. They're coming to you in a state of arrogance. Um, And of course, uh, the most significant one, though, is mentioned yet again in verse 19. Uh, If you look with me at that, he says this. So they're, they're trying to disqualify you by insisting on these things, They're doing so because of their arrogance, right? And then verse 19, and they do so because they do not hold fast to the head that is Christ. And look at verse 19 again, because it actually will give us the positive way that we do grow as Christians, right? He says, they do not hold fast to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. You see, the, on the positive side, the way that Christ has designed you to grow, we're talking about growing and changing, the way that he's designed you to do that is two, two ways. Number one, being knit together with him, right? That's Christ in you, trusting in him for your righteousness, not trusting in your obedience, right? Going to him for the things that you need, not trying to do those things yourself, right? Being quick to go to him for forgiveness, quick to forgive others. The second way, though, is he talks about the body being holding fast to the head and then, secondly, being knit together. So he says the way that you grow as a Christian is that you're knit to Christ and then you're knit to one another. You're knit to Christ and you're knit together to one another. And any time 
By the way, anytime legalism enters a relationship, right, how many of you feel really close to someone who judges you all the time? Right? Any, how many of you, if you were to say, you know, person I feel closest to in life is the person I feel most judged by? Right? Chances are low that that's true at all. And I'll tell you that one of the cool things about Ironworks um, in, in God's blessing on Ironworks is that, you know, if you're new to this community, if you're trying to figure out who, who we are, Ironworks has, was started and still continues to strive to be a place where there is not judgment, right? Where there's freedom, where you can be who you are, you can have your sins and your weaknesses, you can have your failures, you can even have opinions that are unpopular, and you will be truly and substantially loved and accepted, right? That's who Ironwork strives to be, right? And, and this culture has been established to one degree, not perfectly, we have a long way to go on this, but that you can go to a home group, and the time can come when it's time to pray, and instead of you just searching your mind, finding something to fill that space with, you can say, you know what, I'm going to be vulnerable with you and let you in on my actual real sins, right? You can say, look, I, I failed this week. I, I lied to my spouse. I, I looked at images on a computer that I shouldn't have looked at. I, I was not honest with my employer. You, know, you, can, you can share real things because the community Right? The community that you're with are folks who say, yeah, same here. That's who I am. And I don't judge you. We pray for you. And friends, as you do that, as you are knit together with each other and to Christ, what this passage says is that you grow with a growth that is from God. And, and it's kind of interesting and ironic, but actually when you do that, when you reject legalism and you embrace Christ, you find that you grow in ways that the legalists can't. There's been really too many scandals to name. Um, one, one of the more striking ones, of course, was uh, a man named Bill Gothard, if anyone knows that name. Right? He was a legalist of legalists. Right? He had all kinds of rules about all kinds of things and um, had an entire ministry devoted to moral excellence in life, right? And of course, a couple of years ago, it came out that he was uh, molesting staff members, um, which, which is happening more and more. We're finding more of these scandals come out that the ones who are the most legalistic are having these scandals just come crashing down upon their ministries. And why is that the case? Well, I would direct your attention to verse 23. This is the, the final argument that Paul says, right? He says, you know, not only is legalism um, something that not should be tolerated, right? Not only does it serve as a distraction to Christ, not only does it separate people from becoming close to one another, but look at verse 23. These indeed, talking about these rules, about not touching and tasting and handling, right? He says, these have an appearance of wisdom. They make it look good, in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body. But look at that last part of the sentence. They are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. You see that? They have no power. They lack spiritual power. Right? If you were, if you were trusting in a rule to restrain your flesh, right? Bill Gothard's entire ministry was about rules to restrain the flesh. Decades of work spent on this, right? And everything comes crashing down. Why? Because they are powerless. They don't work. They are a substitute for Christ. They are a distraction from Christ. And what Paul will go on to say is that they actually originate with Satan himself. You'll see that in uh, verse 20. He says, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world. And, and in the Greek language, this is a um, root word there is a word we saw actually a couple weeks ago come up, this word stokion. Anytime you see that, that's code for 
demonic power as we saw it in uh, the Timothy reference uh, as well. He says, if you've died to the spirits of the world, why do you submit to its rules? Why do you submit to these things if you've died to these forces, right, if if with Christ? And of course, um, what we're finding out here is that these rules are absolutely powerless to cause growth. And so, friends, as we consider this passage, the simple aim of it is let us hold fast to Christ Let us hold fast to one another, right? If you're someone who likes to follow the rules, cling to Christ. If you're someone who struggles to follow the rules, cling to Christ. If you're someone who uh, goes around with just a weight of guilt upon your soul, go to a home group and confess that. Ask someone to pray for you. Take a risk in being vulnerable and find out that actually you're not the only one, but there's all kinds of other folks that are dealing with the same things. Contribute to this culture that says we reject judgment and we prize freedom. Because at this table, at this table, what do we see? We see Christ welcoming even his enemies. We see Jesus Christ laying down his life, putting it all on the line so that even the, the biggest sinners, the chief of sinners, Paul loved that title for himself. He says, you know, I'm the chief of sinners. Christ, the only reason Christ saved me, Paul says, is so that he could prove to anyone who doubts that he really does love sinners. Because look at me. And so friends, I want you to not distract yourself from your sins this morning. I want you to face them head on because I want you to see in this table the true depth of his love for you. I want this table to to be effective in knitting you to his very soul. And as you do that, as you're knit to him and to one another, you will grow with the growth that is from God. Let me pray for us. Father God, we praise you, Holy Spirit, we adore you. And I pray, O oh God, that you would come and that you would fill this place, uh, that this table would truly be effective in knitting our souls to you and knitting them to one another. We pray this in your name. Amen.